I remember walking through the crowd to get toward the door. I don't remember leaving the house, but I remember a little bit walking up the path at the front of the house. And then the next thing I remember, I was out of my body in the white light, looking down. My The car was smashed, like really smashed when I... Uh, I saw it after I got out of the hospital. It was hard to believe someone lived in there. And uh, my body was leaning against the tree like this with my legs straight out. My head was cracked open, obviously blood all over. And a police officer was crouching over me. It was nighttime. It was dark there. Where I was, it was all white. Uh, behind me, there was a big circle of white. And within there, there was like a silhouette, of a, like a full silhouette of a being of all different shades of white. And off of the be being was even a third shade of white radiating. Life is but a dream. Life is but a dream. Life is but a dream. Yeah. Hello, you beautiful souls. Welcome to the Praise the Sound podcast, where I'm honored to have on my guest, Dr. Lawrence Brock. How are you doing, doctor? Good. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be on your show. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you for being here. Um, I've been talking to a lot of different people who've had NDEs lately. So that's just been kind of the direction I've been, I guess I've been going in because I find these stories some of the most fascinating and powerful stories that I could possibly, you know, ever imagine. Sometimes they feel even more tangible and real than people who like have past life regressions and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, I guess the difference between these NDEs and other people's experiences, like you guys like actually left the body. <laughs> like you guys, you know, yeah. this wasn't a hypnotic regression. This wasn't, you know, you channeling or anything. You're, you're like leaving the body and like having these experiences. So just, it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, I realized someone asked me the other day if I believe, I don't even remember what they were asking me. I said, I used to believe, now I know. When you yes. have the near death experience, you just know it, you know, and no one can take that away no matter what they say. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And I, I reflect on that that uh, exact statement very often because it, it really is the difference between believing in something and knowing something. And, um, you know, knowing something is just it's not even something that you have to, you know, believe in. You, you can just share your experience and whether, whether someone believes it or not, it doesn't matter because you know it's real. It's You know it's true. Yeah. And usually people get the feeling, even if in your mind you don't know it or believe it even, you get a certain feeling when people share their story and it just feels real. Exactly, 100%. So for the audience who uh, who's not familiar with you, could you give us like, I guess, your life before the NDE and then the NDE and then kind of where you're at now? Yeah, um, so this happened in when I was 22. I'm actually going to be 70 on June 27th, so some years ago. Um, I had been living in Colorado, working in a restaurant, uh, living. I, I liked my life. It was good. I enjoyed working in a restaurant. I started out actually as a dishwasher and worked my way up to second chef. And, but it was definitely kind of a partying lifestyle where I'd work, you know, usually start work at like two or three in the afternoon and work till, you know, 10, 11 at night and, you know, drinking beer a lot, smoking pot. And, um, I knew something was kind of missing in my life. I was even thinking of going back to school for something. Um, and then my roommate out there was also a friend of mine from the Northeast where I grew up in Rybrook, New York. So we decided to head back East to visit our parents. And we drove, he had a 280Z, a Nissan. That was this great fun car to drive. So we drove pretty much straight through. And when we got back to uh, Westchester, New York, we decided to go to, you know, I went to my parents' house, he went to his parents' house and rest for a while and then look for something to do at night. I don't remember which one of us found out that one of our friends from high school was having a party. We decided to go and I drove my mother, my mom had this little Ford Bobcat and my friend went in his kind of cooler car and we were there. It was a great party. I still remember it. It was, you know, pat, the house was packed. There was music. And even to walk through the party, you had to 
push your way through the crowd, definitely partying, uh, smoking pot, drinking, kind of as a way of, so there was a, a young lady having the party that I thought was kind of cute. And at the party, it was really loud. There was no way to really talk to people. And um, I came up with a plan. I was going to tell her I was too high to drive <clears throat> and leave my mom's car there. And so I could actually, I didn't feel like I was too high, but I was going to go back the next day and, you know, try to flirt with her and ask her out. So I had my friend drive me back to my parents' house. When we were almost there, I realized my sister needed the car the next morning for work. So I had him drive me back uh, to the party. I remember going through the crowd to go tell the young lady that I was going to take my car. I remember walking through the crowd to get toward the door. I don't remember leaving the house, but I remember a little bit walking up the path at the front of the house. And then the next thing I remember, I was out of my body in the white light, looking down. My The car was smashed, like really smashed. When I, uh, I saw it after I got out of the hospital, it was hard to believe someone lived in there. And uh, my body was leaning against the tree like this with my legs straight out. My head was cracked open, obviously blood all over, and a police officer was crouching over me. It was nighttime. It was dark there. Where I was, it was all white. Uh, behind me, there was a big circle of white, and within there, there was like a silhouette, of a, like a full silhouette of a being, of all different shades of white. And off of the be being was even a third shade of white radiating. I don't know how long it was. And my experience was way more feeling and kinesthetic than knowing in my mind what was going on. Um, but it felt, I often compare it to just when it's the perfect weather outside and you can, can kind of feel it on your skin or you go swimming in the water and it's a perfect temperature. It just felt so nice. There was a understanding that went with it, a loving, kind of a knowing, but in a certain way, knowing would involve not knowing something. So you know something, but it was just like knowing everything was okay. So there were no questions. Um, then, and I don't know how long it was, but there was the great loving and understanding with it. The being behind me said, you have to go back. Your father wants you to stay. I knew right at that moment that the being, that that being was talking about was, you know, the father was not my physical father, but God. So I went back into my body and came to three days later in the hospital. I remember a little bit kind of almost coming up to consciousness over those three days, but it was mostly kind of hazy, just seeing white uniforms walking by, which I assume was the nurses. My understanding of what happened didn't happen till a little while later when I started learning about spiritual things. Two of the things that happened that were no denying it were I started meeting a lot of spiritual people, a lot of people that had near-death experiences, and my hands would become warm when I touch people. And you got to understand it's not like a time like now where you the near-death experiences are a thing. I had never heard of it. I know around that time that phrase was created, um, but it was kind of observing what was going on in my life and trying to figure it out at the same time. I kind of compare it to, it was like being in a movie that I didn't have the script to. So things happen where I would meet people. Some things happen where I help people heal without even realizing it. And one of the really cool things that happened was, so I was, after I was healthy enough, I went back to Colorado and I went back to working in the restaurant. And at that time, I just wasn't really feeling it anymore. And then my mom kind of bribed me to move back East again and go into business with my, in my dad's electrical contracting business. I was sitting in my apartment one day and someone knocked on the door. Again, a time when there were no cell phones or internet or anything like that. So like now if someone knocks on the door and I don't know who it is, I assume it's a delivery of some sort. So, but I got up and answered the door. There was this beautiful woman there and she said, 
I'm the sister of a good friend of yours from Colorado. My sister told me some cool things about you. Now, her sister was one of the few people that I mentioned my experience to, not using the word near-death experience. But again, it was almost like, I don't know, I didn't really talk to too many people about it. Even though I knew that it happened, it wasn't like I knew what happened. It wasn't like in my mind I understood what was happening. This woman came in and she said to me, I know someone who teaches about what happens after we die and I want to introduce you to him. So she introduced me to this guy. He was a Sufi sheikh who's an Islamic teacher and he started teaching me about spiritual things. So I ended up spending about 10 years studying with him. He taught me a lot of cool healing things. But during one of the classes I was in with him, he first started to talk to me about Mary. And he was talking to the class, but th at this point he was looking directly at me. And I remember just kind of praying I could take the energy of his stare because he was this very intense guy. And when he said how much Mary loved God and that's how she received the Christ energy, I realized that that love she was he was talking about was what I experienced in my near-death experience. Then he started to talk about Jesus. And as soon as he did, I knew that that being behind me was Jesus. There were other parts of understanding that came along the way. A lot of it was stumbling and bumbling my way through meeting people and having things happen that helped me understand. I'm, it ended up being a blessing that I didn't know because it's spiritually, it's important to know that you can't really understand it in your mind. So that not knowing became a great way for me to learn. Wow, fascinating <laughs> story. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, so let's talk about um, the the Jesus part for a bit. How, I know in the spiritual, when, uh, they're, when people are in a spiritual state, they're just kind of that intuitive knowing, but was there anything else that you felt that let you know that I was that was Jesus behind you? Was there? Features. When it happened, I did not even think of that. I was born into a Jewish family, so it's not like you're thinking Jesus or anything like that. And right. um, yeah, I really had no idea in my mind what to make of it. I knew, definitely knew it happened and something changed in me. I mean, like that woman just showed up at my door. I didn't even do anything. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like you get connected. And uh, so then it was like trying to figure out like, why are these things happening? Part of me kind of would just have rather gone back to work, you know what I mean? And not, but now I'm glad I didn't do that. Right, exactly. You were destined for more, certainly. Yeah. Um, so, so once, once you are in that energetic space and you, you leave your body, is it just instantaneously that you feel the love of God or how does that, that love energy come into your awareness? For me, it was seems instantaneous, but I don't remember. So I don't remember the accident at all. So it was like walking toward my car, being in the light. So I didn't have any, um, but now I get to experience that regularly. Um, so I have that reference of what it was. Plus I've studied, I practice in my work. It's almost instantaneous that I get into that, connect into that energy. And even as I say it, I start to feel some energy in my hands and a little shaking in my heart center. There's, it's the intention. And, you know, before we started, we were talking about now I know that. So it's not just believing it, it's knowing it. And as soon as I connect into that knowing, then that energy starts to come in. And, you know, uh, now I'm trying to think and do that at the same time, but it almost like my whole body starts to shake a little bit. So when I'm working with people, I've learned how to kind of hold that energy around them and see in that way, even though I didn't really have any visions or anything, I just knew everything was okay. And the, you know, things in the world, things in my life, and I can kind of look at it that way with the client and it's holding that energy for them so they can unfold into that. I don't want to say perfection because it's, less dramatic than that it's just like everything is okay it really describes it because it's peaceful it's not like yay it's more like oh yeah everything's solid and right mm, 
Okay. Got you. Wow. Fascinating. So, um, so were you able to feel that love before this NDE? Or did this um, kind of like open up something within you that access that more readily? You know, I had some things happen to me, spiritual things before, but it was I able to feel it? I would say yes. And in one way, I was searching for that, but I would have never even labeled it being spiritual. You know, I, I just felt like I was a normal teenager. I had read some autobiography of a yogi. I had read some Herman Hess books. and uh, But the spiritual part of it, even when I read those books, it was like, well, that was for someone else. Like a book I read was On the Road, you know, and the, people are traveling, looking for things and not knowing exactly what it is. So uh, before my near-death experience, a couple of years before that, I did see my passed away grandfather in a movie theater in Manhattan. And it was definitely him. He was a unique looking guy. At first I saw him from the back and then I walked around the front and looked at him. I didn't say anything and I kind of just let it go, which I guess is a hint at my predisposition for being able to do this thing and knowing. Yeah, it's, it's hard to describe, but did I feel a loving? I knew that loving was there, but in my near death experience, I experienced it in such a pure way. It was kind of like all the things in my body were not in the way. So I really, really felt it. Okay. I got you now. So, Okay, so I'm trying to uh, recall how you got into the NDE. So you had got dropped off at the party, right? Well, I drove to the party. I had my friend take me back to my parents, but then I realized I needed to go back and get my car from the party. Right. So I left the party. I remember walking up the path, uh, past out the front door, and then the next thing I knew. So it was about three quarters of the way there. I must have some point blacked out. I don't know how I got from there to there without crashing sooner, but that's what happened. And I went back after I was out of the hospital, there was this little tiny dent in the tree. I, so I crashed into a tree and the car, it was so smashed. I had a picture of it some years ago and I looked through all my dad's things. I don't know where it could be. I wish I could find it because it showed the car. I mean, you look at it, you're surprised anyone lived in there. Wow. Okay, I got you now. So you had blacked out, crashed. Wow. Yeah. So when you crashed, you like woke up in the spiritual state. Yes. Wow. I would. Yes. I don't, yes. My spiritual part was in the light. My body was down on the ground. Wow. Unconscious. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so then, did it, when in the spiritual state, did it kind of feel like an instant? Or did it feel like it lasted a while or? You know, when I tell the story, it takes like a minute, but it felt longer than that. But it didn't feel like some people say it felt like years for them. I, oh, wow. I don't know. It, the, you know, the thing people say, like there was no time, I would say that would be most accurate because it was this part of looking and then there was this f feeling of expansiveness and just kind of knowing everything in the whole world was all right, not just in my life, not just right there. And then uh yeah when i tell the story it seems shorter than it felt but it wasn't super long you know? okay um at any moment were you able to like zoom out further and see like the planet or were you just able to see your body you know i didn't even think you know again we're looking at it where people have had these experiences i did the voice said to me go back and everything seems so good i just said okay i'll go back right you know, I didn't even say that. I just went, it was like, whoosh, like, wow. at that point it felt, it was like, like being a uh, Casper the friendly ghost. It was like, whoosh, that's what it kind of felt like. A lot of people who've, uh, who've had these experiences also say that they, 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 there's that voice. Is that the voice of God to, to you as well? I think it was the voice of Jesus. Oh, okay. I mean, that when, like I said, when the, the shape the teacher started to talk to me about it's like whoa that was jesus and um it was interesting because i was born in a jewish family i connected with this islamic teacher which i didn't even think twice about that i just knew i had to learn from this person and he started to talk to me about mary and jesus 
something I didn't know at the time is Mary and Jesus are in the Quran and it Mary is in in the Quran more times than in the Bible believe it or not. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. So. Okay. But the not knowing part has been part of my journey and still so I started learning from the Sufi Sheikh. There were a lot of classes I spent time and learning helping set up the for the performances of the whirling dervishes and um i learned about healing from him i learned a lot of spiritual stuff but he so he was islamic he talked to me about mary and jesus i was from a jewish family that didn't really seem to matter to me because the the essence of love is there so uh the <clears throat> sect of the sufis that he was a sheikh in were the mevlevi dervishes and they t follow the teachings of Jalaluddin Rumi. And so Rumi, the poet that a lot of people know about his poems, but he wrote volumes and volumes of spiritual books. The biggest, probably the most important one is called the Mathnawi. And in the beginning of it, it says, this is the Mathnawi. It's the root of the root of the root of the religion. And that just sums up what I wanted to know. So it's, and most people don't even think that Rumi think of him as being Islamic because they just read his stuff and it really touches their heart. But people from every religion reads Rumi and loves it. It just transcends religion. So, I mean, there's this became my life kind of unfolding in front of me as me moving along, learning the stuff and trying to figure it out in my mind. Hmm. Yeah, I I was trying to uh, write that down really quickly because I never uh, I I've only knew of Rumi the poet, but I didn't know he yeah. wrote spiritual books. Well, oh no, you got so it's the Math Nawi M A T H. Oh, that's about the wrong. Uh, math now N O W I. Oh, math Nawi. Okay, I see it. But you can go on Kindle now. So I have a story about trying to find the book, but um, okay. On, on Kindle, it's in three separate volumes. You can buy each one for like seven dollars. So for twenty, about twenty-five dollars, you get the whole thing. It's really an amazing piece of. I mean, so many of the indescribably delicious spiritual experiences that we have that are hard to put into words. Rumi put them into words. Um, I guess it's a bit of a philosophical question since we're on a topic yeah. of Rumi. Do you think? um god or creator or universe as many people have names for it um do you think that it likes to speak in like rhymes and parables and and kind of like a, a story type of thing to people i i think that leaves a lot of room for more understanding in there it, right some of the things sometimes so there's a way to do readings in the math now so sometimes i would do readings and the answer was very direct more times than not and even the way i talk because i keep it kind of vague to allow the unfoldment inside the person so i think that is why a lot of the spiritual books are written in stories like that but it it does because our mind can't understand it it's all there is so anything we're ever saying to describe the spiritual experience is wrong it cannot be right it's just so much more so i think that's i think well, when you, I know when I talk to people and I keep it kind of vague and sometimes my clients get annoyed, why don't you tell me exactly what to do? It's like, no, that's not what this is. This is about you unfolding and seeing the truth of who you are. And by keeping it kind of vague, it gets the mind a little confused and then your heart can open up and kind of take the lead. Yeah, exactly. I, I love that. Is something that just came to mind as I was thinking about how the, the ways that Rumi would speak in the poems and then I also look at the Tao Te Ching and that also is kind of like a not not always straightforward yeah. thing I mean the Bible the, yeah uh, yeah all the main, all the, yeah. main books yeah. so this is interesting um, so after this experience did you um, tell anyone like what your parents think and your sister and family yeah well I didn't tell them uh, I mean, I didn't really talk to many people about it. So um, a little bit and let's see, some of the progressions in that were, so I 
got very involved with spiritual stuff. I got my doctorate and a postgraduate degree. And um, my doctorate's in something called spiritual science. So we were using the scientific method to explore spiritual things, basically. Um, so I was I wrote my doctoral treatise on a breathing exercise that actually I realized about two weeks ago I could publish it out a book as a book. So in about two weeks it will be on Amazon as a book. Um, but I was teaching a class at the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut on the breathing and mindfulness and meditation. And after the class, the te- the woman who organized it for me said something. She said. I'm going to be teaching, a, she was going to be teaching a class on death and dying, I think it was called, or about the different rituals and in different religions and different countries about dying. And I said, I, by then I had heard of a near-death experience. So I said, I had a near-death experience. She said, oh, you need to come talk to my class. And so I always, you know, by then I was posting things online. I put something on Facebook about how my class went and the class, I, would teach a few classes per year, just, you know, individual classes each year there. And I said, I'm going to be, you know, talking about my near-death experience. I got so many likes and so many responses like, oh, I want to hear about that. I didn't realize it was a thing, but it was really, it was good because it made it that I could share this part of me. In one way, I was using the breathing to try to get to people about my spiritual experiences and abilities, but then once near, the near-death experience became a thing, that was really a way to share this very, very important part of me. But so then I start posting it and everyone, you know, now everyone wants to hear about it. It's in TV shows, it's in movies, everyone knows about it. Wow. It's, yeah. it's like freedom. <laughs> exactly. Wow, so fascinating. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess what, was there anything that, uh, open up inside of you to allow you to want to speak about it more or kind of just like the natural progression? Yeah, that natural progression. I mean, I, so my healing abilities kind of unfolded in the same way where even though I was learning about them, it, it's interesting because part of me was very resistant and still I'm very skeptical <laughs> in a certain way, even though I know I can help people. If anyone else says they do what I do, I'm skeptical. And I'm always looking at it like, yeah, I need to prove myself. And it needs to be proven. It's not just this airy-fairy kind of feel-good thing, even though that happens. It is I need to prove it. And so as, I mean, I just have things where I get to accept it more and more. So sometimes I help people in such phenomenal ways, it's kind of hard to ignore, but part of me is wants to really prove it and use the scientific approach. Um, People used to say to me once in a while, how do you know it's not all in their head? And I would say, I don't really care if they're better then they're better. Yeah. Let's talk about the the healing aspect because we haven't gotten to that yet. So um, how did this come about? How'd you, uh, become aware that you can do these things and what is it that you do? Yeah, that's a good question. I've been trying all these years to describe what it is. So, um, some things just happened that I help people and, uh, it progressed when I, at some point I started studying. So with the Sufi shake, it wasn't really hands-on stuff. It was more, he would use a pendulum or a dousing rod and find him better. He, worked a lot on the land, but he would say to me, for me, it was on the body. So I learned to use a pendulum and a dousing rod to find imbalances in the body. And then there were just ways of holding certain energy there to help similar that I experienced in my near-death experience to help that person. And um, I got introduced to polarity therapy, which is a whole another. So I have been also besides about to print my book about my, the L breathing exercise I developed, I've been writing a book about my story. So I've been really remembering a lot of the details about how I got introduced to polarity therapy, which is a very gentle form of body work, similar to what people would think of as acupressure, but even more gentle. 
and mostly you're holding two different points and waiting for them to balance. But once I start to use my hands, it really started to make a whole lot more sense to me. So it was, and I studied with that Islamic teacher. Uh, Polarity is more involved with Hinduism because it's based on Ayurvedic medicine. I just studied with a lot of different people from different religions. And uh, I guess I'm still trying to discover what my abilities are. But I, right now I work with people mostly on Zoom or on the phone. I have clients all over the world. So it's, um, I have studied a lot, but it's people talk to me. They feel, feel the, I do hold my hands up like this when I'm working with people. It seems to help hold the energy around them. And it can help with anything. It can help with emotional, physical, you know, mental, uh, spiritual things. It, um, yeah, I mean, I'm very, for, I'm still blown away every time. Like, uh, not that long ago, I was kind of complaining to myself that I hadn't had any really big physical healing in a long time, which isn't really true. It's kind of funny that I was complaining to myself. But then a couple of days after that, a woman sent me a text saying, I want to make another appointment. Some, my energy shifted and I'm able to walk now. And I haven't been able to walk in eight years. And even when I got that, I was a little skeptical, like, well, what, you know, trying to figure out how that could be true and how it might not be true. And, but then I heard from her again, she, you know, and it was interesting because during the session, she talked to me about her not being able to get around very much. And, but she was more talking about the energy in her apartment. And there was a lot of yellow energy that came in. A lot of times the healing energy comes in colors. And I didn't, she didn't feel any, she even said, I didn't even feel anything during the session. But within a few days, I started moving around. She told me she, now she would go to the supermarket and she, she needed to use poles still to walk, but she could walk. And I was like, wow, that was great. Wow. So on your end, when you're working on someone, what are the things that you are feeling in your body or doing in your mind? How does it work on your end? Um, well, I usually hold my hands up, which actually started just a couple of years ago, because as I got away from doing hands-on healing, one of my friends said to me, you're forgetting about the healing in your hands. And I just, after that, just started holding up. So sometimes I feel energy in my hands. Um, it just, when I look at someone, I see this good thing in them, and there's a light in there. There's also, I see their connection into the spirit, which can be, it kind of, there, it's kind of through different traditions, but in the spirit, there's no difference between the different religions. It's more, what is the person's preference here? And then that just gives them a way to connect. Um, there's so many things I can see. So I definitely see things from other lifetimes that need to be cleared up. I can see imbalances in the body. I can see things from someone's childhood or uh, just all, there's so many things, but I, try to keep it really open so I can see pretty much anything. It's not like I'm looking to see only past lives. I'm looking to see what can help this person and what's blocking them. It is kind of like seeing this line that connects them into spirit. And in there, there's health, happiness, abundance, kind of the feeling that I had in my near-death experience, like everything's good. And then there's ways to... It, then it helps them go and connect their energy up here to the right. And then cool things happen. Mm, fascinating. Okay. So before you work on someone, does that, does those, uh, downloads, I guess, if, if I could use that word, yeah. come to you before the session or is it like in the session you're kind of mostly in the session. I try okay. not to do it beforehand. Um, sometimes I, I, sometimes I just meet people and it happens, but I've kind of learned to not do that, but sometimes it does just happen partially because it's a little intrusive to do that. You know, sometimes I'm at a party and people say, oh, what do you see about me? I say, you don't even want me to do that because when I'm working, I'm really looking for the bad things. You know, when I'm socializing, I'm just trying to look for the good thing, this generally good thing in people. So, um. I used to have less control over it. Now I've learned to not do it. Part partially because I really care about people so much, I almost want to help them right away. But 
that's kind of a no-no in, in what I do because it um, it can cause a karmic imbalance that I don't want to be involved with. Right, understandable. I was okay, cool. So I just wasn't sure if um, like they the those just kind of automatically come through, or do you have sometimes to it does, but okay, not too much anymore. It, I mean, it's hard. Yeah, no, life is better not being able to kind of shut it off a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I assume so. Um, so you briefly spoke about um, like past life memories there for yeah. uh, people that you're working on. Um, how often, from your experience, do these uh, affect our current lives, like people's past lives? Yeah, every second, everything. Oh, wow. Yeah, everything's connect Our karma, which has a lot to do with our past lives, what we've come in to learn, and, um, everything. Everything, 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 the kind of ice cream you like, the kind of ice cream you don't like, the kind of people you like, you know, whatever it is, uh, it comes from our karma and almost always a past life. Interesting. So for uh, for the people who can't remember those things, yeah. those, those things that they need to work on, um, how is how how do we access those memories to to work on them cuz i know like a part of the karmic cycle is to work through the karma but if you cannot even remember the karma how do you even begin to work on it in the first place and not you know do do the same mistake over again yeah well it's kind of set up that you can't remember so when i work with someone i can see a lot when it comes to myself i can't see as much uh there's the part of loving yourself and you don't, it's not like you need to do a perfect job of getting through it. You just kind of have to get through it. It's more of the learning is more experiential. Like, oh, I need to go through. I mean, there's good things too, luckily. There's a lot of good things, but it is just going through it. It's not like you need to get an A plus on the test. You need to get more like a C and then you're fine. Okay. Huh. So the way, through your our co positive qualities and attributes is how our soul comes through. So when you're looking to express those, and then how can you express those in situations? So what I'm, you know, for a lot of people, loving is one of the main qualities. And there might be other ways to express that, but it is for me. But it's also, you know, how do I be loving and not be taken advantage of? How do I be loving in a way that's being true to me? So, it, you know, I suggest to people to try to get three of their main qualities in their mind so they can kind of check. Am I being so for me, loving, caring and giving are really important qualities. So when I'm not doing that, I know I'm not being true to myself. So I can check in my mind when I'm feeling a little off and not being able to do it from a intuitive feeling level, I can check, hmm, how can I be in my loving right now? How can I be in my giving? How can I be in my caring? And then usually it, when I identify that, it almost separates me a little from the other person because it's not about me loving them or caring for them, even though that's part of it, or you know, nurturing, that's another one of my things. It's more inside of me, and then how am I letting that expand? Like, how am I being loving inside of me, and then doing that without trying to put it on someone else? Gotcha. Hmm. Okay. So. So meditation and journal writing are the main two tools. Yes, that's what you got to do. Ah, uh, so yes. I have a whole thing of journal writing. If anyone wants it, they could ask me. I'll send it. But part of it is you choose three things that you're kind of working on and you journal write about that. So th these are three kind of negative things that, so for me, sleeping has always been something I'm working on. Uh, sometimes I worry too much. I'm, you know, I'm almost 70, I have some aches and pains in my body. So I write about those. There's part of it where what qualities of mine am I grateful for? And I write about that. Then. There's a part like, what are my goals for today? Almost always I put be in my loving. How can I be in my caring and look at my soul expression as well as doing things in the world, but expressing my positive qualities and attributes while I'm doing things in the world. Nice. Well, yeah. well said. <laughs> um, so 
um, uh, for, so I, I also have here that you're a reverend, correct? Yes. Yeah. So how do you balance some of the things that you know from your experiences with some of the things that maybe some will say that's a, you know, this isn't in the Bible or this isn't in that and this like, yeah, yeah. well, I, you know, I've studied the Bible and I don't see any, I don't see any, you know, like we said, the Bible's kind of written in stories where there's a lot of room for your own interpretation. So my interpretation is the things I do, like the things Jesus did. And the, when Jesus said this, you know, you can do better than me. Those are the things that I encourage people to do, which is through our positive qualities and attributes, like Jesus just could really, really do it. You know what I mean? And he was really committed. He was committed where he just didn't let anything get in his way of him expressing his loving. You know, that's something to aspire towards, definitely. Yeah, and I, I love I love that focus too, because there are definitely a lot of empowering empowering things and a lot of different um things. Uh, the Bible, Quran, you know, there are things that, you know, empower people, but I feel like a lot of times people choose to focus on things that make them feel less than or, or that they don't they, they they can't do certain things. Well, then there's some people trying to control other people, which is not really part of it. So that's that part of what I was saying and not even make it about the other person, make it about me being in my loving. Part of that is I don't want to control the other person. So right. I'm looking inside of me what I can do. Uh, like something happened with my sister not too long ago. Well, so I bought this house about two, about a year and a half ago. and. It's the first time I bought a house and she's a realtor and she knows everything about it. I knew nothing. And sometimes when I spend a lot of time with, you know, we're brother and sister, we start getting on each other's nerves. So I was needed her advice about something and I just didn't want to talk to her at the same time. So I looked inside, said, how can I be, you know, true to myself and my loving, caring and giving? And of course, my mind went first, I could give her some advice. And there's like, nope, that's not what this is, because this that's about me trying to change her. And I go, oh, yeah, I'm looking at her to be doing what I want to be doing. So I got, I can be giving my loving and not on her, but inside of me. And I did it. And it was one of those times where it really went through 100%. Like sometimes I do it and it's 90%, sometimes way less. But, and within a few minutes, she called me and we just connected and it was great. So I really got it and did it. And then it manifests in my life. Thank you. Wow. Interesting. So, um, has there been, um, if you're able to talk about this, has there ever, um, been a client whose past life was like, um, maybe something that you could like, actually look up or something like that like if has it been any thing that someone saw um, or experienced and used like that actually is like a historical thing there or something like that yeah not that i remember but i mean usually when i talk to people about it, they feel it so and things in their life that are connected to it get better um i in general i'm not looking for information or to verify the information i'm looking for how it helps the person so right when that happens uh, i mean it i a couple of things happened there uh one time i was talking to this woman it, it was one of the things that happened early on so it was a big learning for me but i was talking to her on the phone and i saw there was a native american healing guide with her and she started talking saying she had a lot of pain she was diagnosed with arthritis i don't know what she, you know Arthritis used to be kind of a general diagnosis for pain in the body. And um, I said, you know, she talked for a while. I said, excuse me, I see there's this Native American healing guide with you. And she said, oh, I know someone else told me about it. So that was a verification. But I knew she was afraid. I said, you don't understand this guide is there to help you. And she got it. And I could feel her energy shift. And she goes, whoa, the pain went away. Like she had been having pain in her body for years. So, but that was a verification. Sometimes I have things like that. People come to me and they're, you know, kind of 
trying to test my abilities and they don't tell me what's going on and there are times I just get it. So. All right. Do we sometimes have um, various uh, pains or illnesses because there's something that we need to like look within that's going to lead us to that kind of path? Like, like her pain went away when she like yeah. actually focused on it. So why, how do we have those? Well, not everyone has it, but yeah. for the people who do, like how do, how, why does that mechanism work that way? Well, there's just, well, I call it, there's just things to clear. And there's, that's one, I mean, one thing you could do is if you have pain is, well, I do journal writing about that. So I'll, you know, focus on the area and just do some tight, I, I'm going like this because I do journal writing on the computer. But I'll, you know, check out what emotions are in there, what it feels like, what it might relate to, what um, my if I'm, you know, favoring one side or the other, am I being, you know, not being giving, or am I being too giving, or, you know, whatever kind of things are going on there. You can explore that through journal writing. It's a great tool. Journal writing. Yeah. Wow. Most people are very resistant to doing it, but it is one of the main tools, that in meditation. It's and you seen, don't have to do meditation perfectly, even if you're terrible at it. If you do it, it helps. Yeah, it, especially now, it seems like um, we kind of have that resistance to things that bring us into the present moment. Yeah. Because there's just so much stimulus around us from technology all the time. It's just, it's hard for people to slow down put the phone down or whatever else you're doing just do a little writing or do a little meditation you know yeah, yeah. a little bit goes a long way it does so when i was so i took the master's program and the doctor program for meditation in the master's program we had to commit to one minute per day and then two minutes per day in the doctoral program so and committing to one minute is really good partially because you end up doing it longer but even that little bit, taking a little bit is a whole lot more than zero. Exactly. And those things add up over time. I yeah. mean, I, I myself need to, to do that myself, but on a different note, I've been uh, exercising more. I walk three miles every day. And I'm, oh, cool. on, yeah. I'm, on my, I'm on my third mile of doing it. And I'm just thinking, I'm like, wow, you know, three miles every day, 21 miles every week. 84 miles every month, you know, though, that's something that you can do with meditation, you know, five minutes every day, you know, that adds up, that adds yeah, up yeah. to a, a greater, bigger thing. And, uh, I've realized my endurance went up as well too. So, and I noticed back when I was meditating heavy, my endurance went up as well. I could meditate for an hour or two hours. Like it was, it increases. Right. It's, it's easy. Once you get out of the habit, it's a little hard to get in, but once you're in the habits, it's so, so rewarding. It's funny because. I did, um, like I mentioned, I'm going to be publishing my a kind of a public friendly version of my doctoral treatise. And I, you know, realized I wasn't doing the breathing exercise every day. So I started doing it again. And it, it is so great. You know, and then I think, why haven't I been doing this every day? <laughs> now I'm doing it every day. So there's even a quote in there from, I forget who it's from, saying, you know, when you catch yourself holding your breath or, or not doing these things, just be grateful that you're aware of it now and you're doing better than you were before. So it's, you know, it's good to be, be kind to yourself about it. It's, I mean, really we could spend all day just doing spiritual things and exercising, but we have to make a living and, you know, clean the house and stuff like that. So what are, uh, what are some of the things that um, people would come and see you for if they were like, if I, if I had like chronic headaches, would I come see you yeah. or? Okay. Uh, a lot of times people come to me that when they've tried a lot of medical, you know, lots of different medical things, they'll come to me. Uh, a lot of people come to me just to do better spiritually and feel better. Uh, pretty much anything, sometimes relationship stuff, sometimes business stuff, uh, you know, um, all those things. So, uh, yeah, sometimes people come to me and uh, I'm thinking of a couple of people that, when you know, sometimes I follow up if I get a feeling to do that. And these two people in particular said they didn't really feel any change from the session. And I knew they did because I can tell when people are going to feel it. Partially, they almost always do. And then when I, they, I said, you should do another session. And um, basically, when I saw one of the people, I could, I mean, he looked so much better. First of all, his shoulders were like this in the beginning. His shoulders were down. His skin tone was so much better. 
And I said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> I can see. He goes, oh, yeah, I forgot all the pain's gone on my shoulder. And everyone's telling me I look so good. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so oh, I just lost it. I have a, a good one there. Um, so around the oh, I remember now. So have you uh, ever heard the, the the thing that we kind of like plan what we experience in a lifetime before birth? Yes. Yeah. For, from your experience, is that accurate? Inaccurate? It is accurate. I don't think it's as specific as some people think it is, but I think in general we come here to get certain experiences. Something that people like to hear sometimes when I'm working with people, some souls come in to observe and they're there to learn. And it is kind of like writing a doctoral treatise after you pass away where you're going over what you learned or what you should have learned, but it is more experiences as opposed to getting it down 100%. And it is, so there's usually many different ways you can fulfill those learnings. So it's not always so specific, but there, one of my clients in particular, there seems to be people that come in and watch a lot. And it was nice because, I mean, they were pretty sick. And um, so for a while, people were, souls, there were these three women would come in and were observing her being sick. And then they were gone and this guy came in. And it, what I was getting is he was there observing her to get better. And I wasn't really seeing the signs of her getting better, but I was hoping that was a sign that she was getting better and she's gotten quite a bit better since then. just she's been able to express herself a whole lot more which is good um so for in your case of the nde do we do we actually like plan something like that major event to happen for us to kind of create a trajectory path for us um or... again i think kind of in a general way i think part of it was for me i wasn't reading the signs like i saw my grandfather i just ignored you know i had some other spiritual things happen and i was trying to ignore it so spirit came in and knocked me on the, my head to get me in line kind of thing. <laughs> it's quite a knock <laughs> <laughs> exactly so but i think in general we do but obviously we lose touch with that part of us that plans those things so it is how do all these parts come together and that's it's kind of like an experiment I, I like to think of it like, you know, if you're watching a little kid do things and learning things and obviously sometimes doing things it doesn't understand that that's kind of how our soul looks at us. Mm. Very loving, very understanding and uh, now he needs to tweak, you know, be over there a little bit more. So, Right. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Wow. Are you um, able to uh, teach other people the things that you do? Uh, to one degree or another, yes. Uh, you know, but it's like anything. Some people are just better at it. I think. Yeah. I right. mean, um, well, I'll tell you, I talk to someone who does what I do very regularly. I think it's easier to do it for other people. I think the part of knowing that you don't know is really important. And to know there's always more to do. And to really, there's a whole lot of surrendering. Uh, to God's will or, you know, whatever you might call that. Um, so in general, I, I don't know. I'd like to say the answer is yes to what you're asking me, but in general, no, because it's, but, you know, it's kind of like someone who's a singer trying to teach me to sing. I have a terrible voice. So no matter how much they teach me, I'm not going to be good at it. That's true. I get that. Some people have like that natural ability leading yeah. in that direction um i've definitely heard that a few times with uh some of the remote viewers i've talked to or there are some people who just have extra sensories to be like out of this world you know just yeah clear vision so that's really interesting right and, well it's like yeah it's like athletes you know some people are just better singing i mean there's all sorts of things i think um, but i do think people can do self-care a lot by meditating and journaling a lot of people who come to me don't really want to do that. I guess they want, they say they want to, but they're not taking the time to do it. So it's kind right. of a quick, easy way to get the benefits by having a session with me. Right. Hmm. So, uh, from your perspective, what does like the future of humanity looks like? 
That's a good question, yeah. uh, especially in this time, because it seems like there's a direct uh, <laughs> good and the evil. <laughs> yeah, the I mean, I, I mean, in what I see, there's I do think good is going to win out, and it it's just that's the path. But there's a lot of uh, disturbing things going on on the planet right now. So the hard part is don't get caught up in them and to be for me to be in my loving in relation to some people doing things that I think are really wrong. Hmm. And I guess like self-care is also a part of that betterment of us as we, you know, do our meditation and journaling, we, we make ourselves better and that kind of helps propel the collective consciousness in a direction that's beneficial for the planet. The yes. more loving each individual can be, the more love there is on a planet. And that's what the part that is. Know. And also the practical part of making sure you vote. Right. <laughs> yeah. We got to do the practicality things too, as well. Yes, exactly. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Go, oh, go ahead. I just, you know, until not too long ago, I mean, I had certain political beliefs, but I didn't really speak up for them because it seemed like things were uh, going okay. And, you know, but nowadays I think it's really important to speak up and to make sure you go and vote. I think it's really important. Right. And, um, and for the, uh, the audience, um, is there anything that you intuitively feel that needs to be shared with, uh, um, the meditation and journal writing, I could say it 3 million times, but you don't, if you sit there and your mind's going blah, 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 that's fine. If you're journal writing and you don't know what to write, you can just write, I'm not really sure what to write. And, but taking those steps to do that. Um, I think the part of looking for your positive qualities and attributes and finding ways to express them. I do think we are our brothers and sisters keepers. So to help people, is really important. Do, being of service. I mean, the basic spiritual principles are real and true and they help align us in spirit and make us happier. I mean, we're supposed to be selflessly being of service, but you'd be of service. It feels so good. I don't understand why more people don't do it. So. Right. Well, yeah, it, I, I feel like as I've grown and matured and, and worked on myself, I, I've just be, wanted to become more and more service to others as much as possible. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and try not to speak, uh, think too much about the financial aspect of things. Cause I mean, and I feel like in everyone's hearts of hearts, they really just want to help other and in other individuals. And sometimes the you know, the, the, there's a money aspect that people have to think about and consider. Yeah. But I mean, still just, well, that part of giving service. is part of the cycle of giving and receiving. So when you're giving, right. I mean, tithing is a great thing. I mean, giving money to, you know, organizations that, that you feel is doing God's work can help you. I find it helps me make more money because I'm part of that cycle. Right. Yeah, I spend a lot of time each week. I still like to do electrical work. And so I help. There's a church I do a lot of work at, you know, kind of cool. I, I remembered um, uh, one of my last questions I, I had a, I lost, but it came back to me. So uh, what are some of the uh, practical ways to measure spirituality? Like, I know there's a spirit science, right? So what's the science yeah. aspect of spirituality that we can actually measure and test and duplicate? Well, for yeah, part of the schooling was to come up with a way to measure things. But if, you know, your level of joy, enthusiasm, when you feel like you're being true to yourself and what you're doing just kind of makes you smile a bit, you know? Um, yeah, you, there are ways to come up with, uh, you can rate things on a scale of one to 10 if that helps, but um, yeah, it's hard because sometimes if you're doing really good stuff, people are going to resist. So sometimes that's even the way to rate it. But yeah, I, if you feel some joy in your heart, I would say that's it. Yeah, yeah. It, I guess it always will be difficult to, do, uh, to kind of gauge things that are a bit subjective, you know, because you could do some like really intense healing on me, but if I'm like, no, 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 you know, I'm re <laughs> resisting it so much, it, 
you know, and I well, don't the want cool you to. The thing about what I do, it works even. I mean, sometimes people come to me who don't believe in what I do because they're, you know, they've tried everything and they, they've given up and their friends right. kind of force them and they come. And like that, I mean, that woman who didn't feel anything during the session, she was open to it. She made an appointment, but, you know, then afterwards. But I've had times people come to me, they're just there because their spouse or their, you know, sibling or whatever forced them to come see me and they, Sometimes those people are easier to work with because they don't expect anything. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, these are my last two questions. Okay. What, what does love mean to you? That's a good question. I mean, the answer is I could easily just say my daughter because I love her so much. Um, it's, yeah, love is, that's a good question. So when I say, when I'm trying to be in line with my loving, I'm connected to my breath. I'm feeling a certain warmth in here. I feel a certain joy. I'm just looking at the world as something good. I'm kind of looking for good things. And it's just that attitude of seeing good in others and in myself and seeing God in others and in myself. Yes, beautifully spoken. Um, and lastly, what does the sun represent to you? The sun? You mean yes. the sun in the sky or the, the sun, sun in the sky? The, the, the sun uh, in the sky. I don't know. You know, I believe a little bit in astrology, so I definitely think it affects us. It's a big magnetic. I it. I don't know. I don't have. I mean, I like the sun because I like the warm weather, but that's about it. All that it means to me. And I have solar on my house, so I like it when it's sunny out. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Um, yeah. So, where can people reach out to you if they want to contact you? Yeah, and book that's a session? good idea. So, there's a lot of tools on my YouTube channel and lectures and other interviews. It's Dr. Lawrence Brock on YouTube. Uh, my website is lawrencebrock.com, and my you can text or send me a message on WhatsApp if you want to make an appointment at seven three two five six seven six three eight eight. Awesome. Thank you so much, doctor. You're welcome. And, and thank you all for listening. If you made it this far, I'll put Dr. Lawrence information in the description box below. And yeah, thank you all for listening. Thank you for your time, doctor. Praise the sun. You're welcome. Pleasure.